Good afternoon, sports fans, and welcome to today's lecture on sport and society in the ancient Greek world. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to step back a little bit from the specific sets of games and the specific events within those games to look at the broader role that athletics played in ancient Greek culture. Now, in large part, you've already seen this. We've talked about the religious underpinnings of the Panhellenic Games at sites like Olympia. And we've talked about the role that athletics played as a venue for non-militaristic competition between city-states and between aristocratic citizens within a city-state. But today, we're going to make these connections even more explicit. We'll talk about sport and identity, and sport and democracy, and sport and education, and sport and religion, and sport and the military. And in doing so, we'll see how ancient Greek sport was far more than a meaningless leisure activity. So whether you want to sharpen up your brain or gain a blessing from the gods, don't forget the role of sport. Just journey with me as we investigate sport and society in ancient Greece. ancient Greek world was more than just a pastime. It was more than just a leisure activity. It was more than just friendly competition. Athletics were a fundamental part of who you actually were. And to understand why this is so important, you have to understand the historical and the cultural context of early Greece. So remember that Greece wasn't like America, or even wasn't like modern day Greece, where the entire region was ruled by a single political entity. Rather, each city-state was politically independent, and during the 8th and the 7th and the 6th centuries BCE, the population of these city-states, especially the region of the Greek homeland centered on the Aegean, it was growing like wildfire. In fact, it was growing so much that these city-states sent out groups of people to found new settlements all around the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and beyond. So think of the implications of this. You've got Greeks setting up new colonies hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles from where they originally came from. So then you have to think about how this, like what actually makes a Greek colony, right? What makes a Greek a Greek? Language, of course, will be part of it, as will religion. But athletics was also one of the main ways that these new colonies espoused their Greekness and differentiated themselves from other cultural groups in their new surroundings. So the fact that you went to the gymnasium to work out, and the fact that you competed against your fellow citizens in quintessentially Greek sports was part of what made you Greek, even if you were far away from Athens or from Corinth or from Sparta. But Greek sports did more than that. They also served as a crucial connection back to those home cities, what Greeks called a metropolis, very literally, a mother city. Through events like the Panhellenic Games, citizens of Greek colonies throughout the Mediterranean world could return to central Greece not only to compete, but also to kind of reconnect with other Greeks from all around the Greek world. These bonds would then come in incredibly useful when Greeks needed to come together to support a common cause. You know, like a giant looming Persian invasion. Anyway, finally, with athletics, uh, allowed these city-states, it allowed them to compete with one another without having to resort to military warfare. Greeks fought with each other just as much, if not more, than they fought with outside groups. And athletics, as a core part of their identity, allowed for friendly competition between city-states, 
Once again, building those connective bonds that allowed for cooperation in times of need. Okay, so part of the identity that Greek athletics helped promote was a sense of kind of equality among the citizens. We might call this process democratization, not so much in a political sense, like everybody becoming democratic, but rather in a cultural sense in which citizens were considered equal. Now, to really get the impact of sports role in equality, you have to understand that Greece didn't start out democratic. During the period of colonization, in fact, there weren't really any democracies. And Greek city-states from around the Mediterranean, they were ruled by oligarchies, kind of small groups of rich aristocratic men. And this kind of divide between rich and poor, between the haves and the have-nots, that was a big one. And it got so bad in Athens in the mid 600s BCE that there was a major revolt followed by by a bloody massacre, which was then followed by an expulsion of an entire family from the city for decades to come. Anyway, the integration and adoption of Greek athletics, however, began to break down some of those barriers because one of the core concepts of these sporting events, the foot races and the throwing objects and the combat sports and was that all the contestants competing in these, they were completely even on the playing field. The rich didn't get a head start on the poor in the stadion race. And the elites didn't throw a different discus than the peasants. And the oligarchs didn't get brass knuckles in their boxing match against local farmers. One of the core facets of athletics that emerged from this competitive equality was the practice of competing in the nude. And we'll hear more about that in later lectures, but one of the driving explanations for why the Greeks competed in the nude was that it visually demonstrated the equality between competitors. Now, when we talk of equality, it's important to keep things in perspective. We're talking about equality between citizens, all of whom happen to be male and all of whom happen to be free. That leaves a lot of the population, you know, the women and the children and the foreigners and the slaves, all out of the whole equality thing. But nonetheless, this was progressive for the time. The final question then is whether this equality that was promoted through athletics resulted in equality when it came to politics. And some scholars have argued that this is indeed the case, that the city-states most heavily invested in athletics, places like Croton in Southern Italy or Athens on mainland Greece, they were the city-states that were quickest to adopt democratic forms of government. That argument is still, of course, debated for a variety of reasons, but the general idea of sports promoting equality within the citizenry seems to be a generally agreed upon premise. So we've already seen in previous lectures that the Spartans instituted a rigorous form of education, starting for boys at around age seven, and that included substantial athletic training. And while the Spartan form of education may have been the most extreme, authors like Xenophon suggest that formal education, including physical education, would have been a common practice in other city-states as well. This physical education would have taken place in the palestra, the open uh, courtyard rectangular building that was a common feature in gymnasia of the ancient Greek world. And in this space, children would have been taught by a a pedotribes, or a gym teacher, in all the classic kind of gymnastic sports, so running and throwing and wrestling. All the classic events that you'd find at the Panhellenic Games. This sort of kind of personalized physical education would have been a private matter, not funded by the state. There's no public school at this time. And thus the privilege of the primarily kind of the upper classes in Greek society. But over time, the gymnasia became just as much about intellectual as it did physical education as we see with philosophers like Plato plying his trade at the academy in Athens. And as time went on, more of the educational process also fell under the purview of the state. So as time went on, the pedo tribi got paid by the city state for the public education of youth. Over time, those public schools kind of sort of started to develop. Now, one of the more unique aspects of ancient Greek physical education is its connection with pederasty. And pederasty is the ancient Greek cultural practice of older men having both sexual and mentoring relationships with younger teenage boys. 
And while the age difference and the youth of the boys may sound alarming from our current modern perspective, this was considered a normal practice among aristocratic families in many ancient Greek city-states, especially the city-state of Sparta. And philosophical luminaries, such as Plato, they fully supported this practice. Now, the gymnasium was a prime locale for pederastic relationships, according to ancient authors such as Aristophanes. And archaeological remains like Greek vases often show older men trying to entice younger athletes into these mentorship sort of relationships using gifts as a method of that enticement. Okay, so we've seen throughout this course the tight interconnection between sports and religion in the ancient Greek world. And this goes all the way back to the Homeric ep epics and the funeral games of Patroclus, which can be interpreted, at least in some ways, as a religious ritual and part of the aristocratic funerary process. It's important to point out, however, that categories like religion aren't mutually exclusive with other functions as well. So we saw earlier that these games also served important social purposes to repair aristocratic relationships and to redistribute material wealth. But religion certainly was a part of the process, and its role in these early games should not be understated. Now, the Panhellenic games all have clear connections to religion as well. The Olympic and Nemean games, they were dedicated to Zeus. In the Pythian games, they honored Apollo. In the Isthmian games, they were put on for Poseidon. The origin stories of these games suggest some connections to heroes or to the divine. So the victory of Pelops in his chariot race against Oinomaus, uh, or the dedication of the games by Heracles to his father Zeus uh, as a thanks for helping him with the labors, both hint at perhaps heroic origins. And it's been suggested that the earliest games at these sites, they bridged the gap between funeral and religious games. That is, they served as repeated ritual funeral games for heroes such as Pelops. So building upon that tradition of Patroclus, now you're doing the same thing for the heroes of ancient Greece. Other theories about games origins suggest that they may have arisen out of initiatory rites or ritual sacrifices of energy to the gods or as a way to entertain the gods of the Greek pantheon. The archeological remains at the site of Olympia also suggest the religious origins of athletic events. So inside the Altus, right, the sacred precinct at Olympia, the earliest structures of the site of Olympia are very, very clearly religious in nature. So we've got an ash altar to Zeus, a tumulus for the hero Pelops, and eventually temples to both Zeus and to Hera. And that all happened before the stadion was ever constructed. And it's been suggested that the earliest athletic events at Olympia would have actually taken place right here inside the Altus, within, inside the sacred precinct before the construction of the stadion. Now, other intersections occur as well. So athletes would swear their oath to the patron deity of the games to uphold the honor and rules of fair play. So you would swear to Zeus at Olympia. And to determine the starting positions of the races, athletes would draw lots from a vessel dedicated to that god. So to figure out what starting gate you go in, you draw your lot from the vessel dedicated to Zeus or to Poseidon or to Apollo. And if you did break the rules during the games, you had to set up a statue to Zeus with an inscription intended to scare off athletes, uh, future athletes from breaking the rules. Now, whether or not the athletes themselves associated their success or failure with the sporting event, uh, in the sporting event to the gods, that's a completely different sport, uh, story. The evidence is much more fragmentary here, right? So we don't have interviews with people saying, ah, oh, I'd like to thank God for my victory today. But there are at least some things that suggest this may have been the case. So we have cursed tablets, for example, these little inscribed lead tablets meant to bring the wrath of the gods against a foe. And we have some that ask the gods to have one's opponent fail in the contest. So one reads, let Actethian be deaf, dumb, mindless, harmless, and not fighting against anyone. And then another one that says, bind Eutychion in the unilluminated eternity of oblivion and chill and destroy also the wrestling that he is going to do this coming Friday. And then we have a third one that says, if Etikion does wrestle, let him fall and fail and disgrace himself. And in the Homeric epics, we see Athena helping out Odysseus as well to win the foot race in the funeral games of Patroclus. So it's at least 
possible that athletes attributed some agency to the gods in these athletic contests. Now, finally, some athletes were so amazing in their sport that they themselves gained, gained a level of divinity. So winning an event at a major Panhellenic festival was thought to endow an athlete with something known as kudos, an attribute which set him apart from other men and granted him some level of invincibility and exalted him above all others. And particularly impressive athletes like Theogonies of Thassos, they became veritable heroes with cults emerging to them after their death because they would retain some sort of quality, often healing qualities in the afterlife. So as you can see here, the connection between sport and religion in ancient Greece was far more than just a patron god for each set of games. It was deeply embedded throughout the entire athletic process. Now, one of the long-standing arguments about the development of ancient Greek athletics is that the training involved in sport was linked to, or at least helpful with, training for military combat. And it's not hard to see why this is the case. So think of how many Olympic events might be considered useful skills in battle. Sprinting, obviously useful, and later events like the Hoplitodromos, where athletes would actually run in full armor, those were obviously connected. Throwing the javelin is very similar to throwing a spear in combat. All the combat sports, right, wrestling and boxing and the pankration, those would have been useful skills in battle. Horse races would have had parallels with the cavalry. And at least at some point in the distant past, chariot racing would have had its parallel on the battlefield as well. Now, some scholars have actually argued that the development of the gymnasium was, at its core, a military development, originally serving as a place for hoplites, the name for the Greek soldiers, to practice together as a phalanx, the name for the Greek battle formation with people lined up right next to each other. While this interpretation is still debated, most scholars do agree that the athletic training that would have happened inside the gymnasium was useful preparation for the battlefield even if it wasn't a bunch of soldiers practicing their formations together. As we've seen though, even this has its critics. And if you remember back to Alexander the Great, he mocked the statues of Olympic victors at the site of Miletus, asking them where they were when the Persians came to destroy the town. Now, some scholars take things in an entirely different direction. So suggesting that athletics would have emphasized an alternative to military warfare. So in the Homeric age of heroes, right, soldiers might win individual fame on the battlefield. But as the phalanx formation developed, Greek militarism favored group work over the work of an individual. And thus athletics allowed the individual to shine once again, with aristocratic men competing against their peers in an individual way that wasn't really possible on the battlefield anymore. Now, in reality, Military and sport are probably a combination of all these things. Working out in the gymnasium undoubtedly did help people on the battlefield, but athletics also provided an alternative way for Greek men to demonstrate their arete, or excellence, in a non-life-threatening sort of way. So how does all this relate to the modern world? Well we could spend a whole course on the role of sports in modern society. And in fact, that actually sounds like a pretty awesome course. Maybe I should develop that course one day. Anyway, that's for the future. Back to the matter at hand, let's think about the connection between sport and society in the modern world. So we mentioned earlier that Greeks would use sport to distinguish themselves from barbarians and to build bonds within the Greek community during the period of colonization. And we saw that some scholars have argued that athletics in the Greek world were an important part of the drive towards equality and eventually towards democracy among the citizens. Now, for the most part, I don't think we have quite the same cultural connections in the modern world. I'm not sure sports are usually the thing one thinks about when differentiating nation states or ethnic groups. And I haven't heard much about sports being a driving factor in the American or the French revolutions of the late 18th century. But that being said, Athletic and sport, athletics and sports have undeniably impacted the larger framework of culture in the 21st century. I mean, you walk through any major city and you see the number of people wearing some sort of clothing that represents their NFL or NBA or MLB or NHL team. And you'll see that sports are still a part of our identity. 
A huge swath of the population represents and identifies with their city through their sports teams. I mean, maybe sports teams are actually the most prominent way that people develop an identity connected to a city or to a university. Then you have to consider the economics of sports today. We didn't really touch base on this in the ancient world yet, but in today's world, the global sports market is estimated at about, get this, about $500 billion per year. $500 billion a year. I guess, and guess like what's nearly doubled in the last decade or, or about that, right? So that $500 billion is about twice what it was a decade ago. Now, in terms of formal education, phys ed in our elementary and high schools might not be very impressive. But imagine the vast network of youth sports outside the classroom. So rec center basketball leagues, CYO soccer leagues, Pop Warner football. All of these things might be considered some sort of education, even if they're not traditional classroom education in that kind of classic sense. And what about the military? Well, you've got the obvious academy sports teams, right? Army and Navy playing football against each other. And who doesn't like watching that? So yeah, really digging into this would take way more time than we've got today. But rest assured that sports is just as integral in today's society as it was for the ancient Greeks 2,000 years ago. It's just that those connections tend to manifest themselves in slightly different ways. Alrighty, you have made it to the end of another episode. So today we have seen the wide world of varied connections between ancient Greek athletics and other facets of society that they relate to. So things like identity and politics and education and religion in the military. And in many ways, this really is the core of this whole course. When we study sport, whether it's in the ancient world or in the modern world, what we're really doing is studying culture more broadly. And sport is fascinating, not just because of the events themselves, but because of all the different ways that they intersect with society. So next time you shoot some hoops or go for a run or battle your roommate in a Pankration style fight, consider all the other connections to society that arise from those athletic pursuits. Just a few lessons you can learn from sport and society in ancient Greece. <laughs>